just want to read uh, from the Gospel of John. Uh, when I want to speak on today, it's hard really to find one passage which covers what uh, the subject what you uh, understand in a moment. But uh, I just want to pick up from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, uh, the beautiful verses there, and we'll touch on them uh, as we go through. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him uh, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not overcome. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about that light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, uh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we leave the, the reading there. The question that um, I want us to consider this afternoon is, what is God like? What is God like? I'm sure if I was to come around and ask you, you might all have some idea of what your response would be to the question, what is God like? If we went to ask some of the people in this building or wider into Cardiff and ask them, what is God like? They would probably come back with all sorts of answers. I don't know, some force out there, um, some uh, person who's power hungry and glory hungry. Uh, they might have an idea of God as perhaps this judge who sits on this throne waiting for us to slip up and uh, looking forward to, to eking out some judgment upon us. There might be all sorts of ideas. But what we want to ask the question this afternoon is what, what does God say about himself? What does he say I am like. And I think part of the answer, or to get to the answer, we need to consider the nature of God. There are lots of different religions in our world. Some are what they call monotheistic, that is they worship one God. Islam would be an example of that. Others would be polytheistic, that is they worship many gods. And Hinduism, Shintoism, Buddhism perhaps would have elements of that in them. But what about Christianity, how does God, the God of the Bible, present himself to us? Well, he presents himself to us as both one and many. It seems almost to be a bit of both, doesn't it? He presents himself as both one and many. Or we should perhaps say one and three. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And you have that clearly presented to us in the Bible. We come to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Paul states, there is one God and one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, you'll find that we read there, it says, Hear, O Israel, children of God, people of God, listen to this. And he goes on to say, the writer goes on to say, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about the one Lord. So there's clearly a message that we have a God who is one. But also, as we go through, there is evidence that he is also more than one in that sense. If you go to Genesis chapter 1, we read, in the beginning, God. And that word for God there in the original, it's a plural word. In the beginning, God's. When you come to Genesis 1.26, what does it tell us there? God said. Now there was, no, there was no man there to be talking to. God was, if you like, talking to himself. So perhaps talking to yourself is not a sign of madness. It's divin no, we won't go that way. But God said, what does he say? Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. You've got us and our. When he comes to the commission at the end of Matthew chapter 28, what does, he, what does he say? What does he tell his disciples? He says to his disciples, go into 
Make disciples of all nations, he says. And he says to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so what Christ is saying there, he says that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit have equal authority. We think of God perhaps as God the Father, but Jesus Christ there, when he makes that statement, is putting himself and the Holy Spirit on the same level as God. In Philippians chapter 2, when Paul is talking about unity, he said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. It wasn't an act of theft, it wasn't an act of robbery for Christ to claim to be God. And so God presents himself in, to us as the one who is also three. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And theologians have spent hours talking, writing to try and get to the bottom of that. And uh, How does that mechanic work? How does one and three operate? And this afternoon, I know there are people who have looked into that and could debate that and discuss that with you more than I ever could. But what I want to do this, uh, this afternoon is just to help us understand what does it mean when God declares himself to us as the one but who is also the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And people, Christians, have tried to communicate that using several examples. Sometimes they say that God is like a triangle. A triangle is one, and it has three sides. Usually they picture a equal lateral triangle of equal sides. And what does it communicate to us? It communicates, yes, that God is one, it communicates the, to us the unity of that one, that the three are the same, that the three are divine, but it, it falls down a bit because it doesn't really portray the distinctness of the three persons, that there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with different roles. And when you think of a triangle, I don't know what does that convey to you. As I look through life, I can think of lots of useful things which are square, oblong, round, but I've got to be honest, triangles don't come to the top of my most useful shape. Now, there are uses for triangles. Roofs benefit from triangle shape. There are signs on the road which are triangle. But if you were to ask me honestly, well, that really conveys a shape of limited usefulness. Is that the sort of picture we want of God? Is that what God is trying to, or does that really muddy the waters? Another one is the egg. Another <coughs> illustration that's often used. You've got one egg, three parts, the shell, the yolk, and the white. And in a sense, that brings out the distinctness. You've got these three definite parts. But I don't know, it doesn't quite, while well, it emphasise the distinctness, it doesn't sort of bring home the, the unity of it all. You've just got these one, three distinct parts. And I don't know about you, when you think of egg, apart from food and filling your, 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 your stomach and perhaps being nice to eat, what comes to my mind is something that's breakable, but something that's very fragile. And so when perhaps we Christians take up uh, this example, oh, God is like an egg. Mm, is that really the sort of God we want? Is that what we're trying to communicate? That he's this fragile thing? Another one is water. We like that. Because that's three in one. Or you've got the element, the H2O, and it can have three forms. It can have ice, liquid, or steam. And so often that's used. You know, God is like water. It's one, but it can change into these three different forms. But what, what, what does that communicate to us about God? Does God leave us all damp and cold? <clears throat> does God freeze us out? Is he a bit like steam, that he's there one moment, gone the next? Or when he's there and you try and get close to him, it just scolds you. Is that the idea of God? And perhaps in the past we've taken illustrations like this to try and communicate something of the nature of God, about what God is like, and actually we've muddied the waters and we can leave people with the impression <coughs> that we have this God who is of limited usefulness, that he's this fragile, changeable person that you can't really rely on and, and trust because he's like this one moment and it's like steam and ice and, and all the rest of it. But I want to suggest to you this afternoon, when God declares to us that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
He is getting to the heart and declaring to us something of what He is like. You know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When Christ was talking about the Holy Spirit, He referred to Him as the Helper. Literally, the one who draws alongside. What does that communicate to us about God? You know, when you think of Father, Son, and Helper, the first thing that springs to mind is that God communicates to us that He is a person. He was a person. We shouldn't be surprised by that. Because He made us in His image. And what are we persons? <coughs> God is not an it or a thing or some impersonal force. He is a person who thinks and feels and loves. That's what God communicates to us when he declares to us that he is Father, Son, and Spirit, or Father, Son, and Helper. What else does he communicate to us? Well, Father, Son. That's that parent-child relationship, isn't it? One of the close, perhaps outside the, the marriage, one of the closest relationships you can have. I know sin has come into our world, and in many families that relationship is not perhaps what it is, but it's that close love relationship. And so when God declares to us that he's father and son, he's declaring to us that he loves, and he is a lover. When he declares that he is helper, helpers are people who come and look after you because they care for you. He's communicating to us that he is one who is love. That he is a lover. And John, as we read a bit from John this afternoon, John drives that point home in his gospel. John 3.16, the most famous verse probably in our Bible, for God so loved the world. But in his letter, as the <coughs> says, he's driving it home all the time. He has that statement, God is love. He talks about the fact that we love God because he first loved us sent his son to be the propitiation or, or to pay the price for our sins. And so when God declares himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he declares to us that not only is he a person, but he declares to us that he is love. He is love. But when you have that Father-Son relationship, it also declares to us, God is saying that Family. I'm about family. <coughs> That's what it declares, isn't it? Father said, where do you find the father? And said, you find them in part of the family unit. And he declares to us, I'm about family. And that shouldn't be surprising for us either, because in Genesis 2, he created family. He set up family. He said that a man should leave his uh, mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He created family. And that's why we shouldn't be surprised in John 1 that I read you in the Gospel of John chapter 1. That he said, the Bible says that he came to his own and they didn't receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become, what? Children of God. He gave them the right to become part of his family, to have God as their heavenly father. To have, when I say it reverently, Christ as the big brother. And so when he declares to us that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he's declaring to us that he is about family. But he's declaring something else. Because you cannot have a person who loves, who's part of family, without having something else. Those three things lead us to a conclusion. They lead us to this conclusion, that God is also about relationship. Relationship. God is, first and foremost, a relational God. Because people have the idea that God is power hungry, that he has to dominate everything, that he is glory hungry, that, hungry, that he is some sort of glory grabber. But you know, before this world was even created, God existed. Who was he having power over then? There was nothing, there was no people for him to have power, there was just him. Who was he going around then and saying, hey, look at my glory? There was no one to do it then. But 
what he was doing in eternity past. The Bible teaches us, we could go to John 17 if we had time, but there was just this perfect relationship, fellowship going on between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The discussion was actually going on about well, let's work out this plan of salvation. So there was talking going on. There was relationship going on. There was that perfect fellowship going on. And God is fundamentally relational. That's why when you come to Romans chapter 5, that famous passage in that book of Romans where he talks about the gospel and he says we as human beings were without strength. He says there that you know, God loved us and demonstrated that love to us. That while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies, the word is used a little later on. Christ died for us. And then when you get into verses 10 and 11, three times it mentions something. And that word that it mentions is reconciliation. The whole point of God sending his son, this love that he has, and sending Christ to die on the cross was to bring about reconciliation. And what is reconciliation? It's the restoration of a broken relationship. Why should it be that in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that Paul declares by the Holy Spirit there is one God and then immediately you have there is one mediator between God and man. The statement is one God. The next statement says there is a way to have a relationship with that one God. Why? Because God is relational. That's what Father, Son, and Holy Spirit declare to us about what God is like. But let's just think of one more. What about the unity? We thought about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and how they declare to us certain things about what God is like. God is declaring to us, I am a person. He's declaring to us that I am love. He's declaring to us that I'm, I'm about family. He's declaring to us that I am relational. The Father's oneness. What's that declare to us? You know, you could have three people in a room. They could be family, they could be close friends, but it wouldn't take long before there would be some sort of argument. Let's go for the family for that one. <laughs> close friends, they might not have an argument, but it wouldn't be long before there would be a difference of opinion. Wouldn't there? And not that I watch it, but the whole Big Brother thing on television is built around that. Let's get all these different people from different backgrounds, shove them in a room. You know what we're going to have? We're going to have fallouts. Hey, we've got entertainment. But you know, if we could take Big Brother style cameras and hone them in on God and watch God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in operation, these three, we would never see a difference of opinion. We would never see a fallout or an argument. Why? Because they are one. You won't go to God with some issue, God the Father with some issue, and get one answer for him, and then go to Christ with an issue, and get another answer from him. It will not happen. Because with that oneness, they give us consistency. With that oneness, they give us reliability. And a consistency and reliability that can be trusted. And so, the answer to our question, what is God like? We can have all sorts of ideas. But through God's declaration that he is one, and yet three, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he is declaring to us that he is this person who loves us, who wants us to be part of his family, who wants more than anything else to have this relationship with us and says to us, I'm completely reliable, I'm completely trustworthy. And let me ask you a question this afternoon. Is that the sort of God you'd be willing to commit your life to? Is that the sort of God that you're willing to forsake your sin and trust? The problem with sometimes with us as Christians, we change what God is like. In our minds, sometimes, especially we've gone down the lines of God has said, I am God, and he has declared himself as God the judge, God the barrister, and God the condemner. And for some of us, perhaps that's our view of God. 
That's not how God declares himself to us. Yes, man has, because of man's disobedience, sin has come into the world. But we can't pass over sin. And because of sin, unfortunately, God has had to take up a role of judge. There will be a time in the future when he will have to stand as the one who is the barrister, who, if you like, who, 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 who considers the case. And he is the one who perhaps may even be the one who condemns. But that's not what he's like. Those are things that the presence of sin has meant he has to do. But that's not what he's like. Sometimes we live in fear of a God. We feel that we have to do X, Y, and Z, and if we don't, he's on us like a trumpet at the time of breaks, he'll be jumping on us and squashing us down, and, and, and he's just waiting for us to, to, to make that slip up. That's not what he's like. of God we need to have as Christians that we would live in the joy and the love of the relationship that we have with him. And it's a view of God that we need to have to proclaim the gospel. Jesus Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And somehow he meant, look at this wonderful God that I am. Lift up the fact that as God we are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we are the person who loves, who cares, who, who, who just wants to take you as, and be part of the family. And for some reason, what we're proclaiming is a different God. A God who is not like that at all. And perhaps then we wonder why people perhaps are not drawn to Him. God says, What am I like? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Person who loves you. Who wants more than anything else to be part of my family. I want to know you. I am completely reliable. Completely trustworthy. Let's pray. Father, again, we just want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you, Father, for who you are. We want to thank you for the way that you have declared yourself to us. <clears throat> Father, we do pray that uh, you will help us to keep this view of you in our minds and our hearts. Father, we pray that you would forgive us if we have muddied the waters, if we have replaced that view of you with some other view. Lord, help us to live our lives in the light of who you are and what you have done for us. Help us, Father, to enjoy the relationship that to enjoy the fact that you are our Father. To enjoy the fact, Father, that you love us. Lord, that you would help us to see more of your beauty, more of your wonder. And that, Father, it would just be a natural thing for us to leave behind all those things that cause you pain and sadness. As we fall, as it were, more and more with you. So, Father, by your spirit, help us with these things we pray. Thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name.